What's going on? Welcome back to the Look Mum, I'm Hustling podcast. Unintentionally, we're wearing both punk rock, pop punk, and emo band shirts. I'm rocking the Blink 182 shirt in preparation, 12 months away from when the concert comes over here, if it does eventually come up over here. And you're rocking the Dashboard Confessional, which you picked up in the thrift last week. Well, you actually found it, which is super exciting. And Blink will happen as long as there's not another COVID or another, like, you know, whole big festival doesn't get cancelled. So I'm excited for that next year. Well, they've actually cancelled a bunch of the South American shows because last time they came here, Travis, or not last time, but one of the previous times they came here, Travis didn't come uh, because of his flight incident where he he was in that horrible horrible plane crash and he mm-hmm. has uh severe phobia and fear of uh planes because you know obviously you get in one crash you, you don't want to get on one ever again it's like me stacking it on the skateboard and being super scared exactly. about getting back on there i mean i'm not comparing my skateboard fall down to a plane crash but i'm just like <laughs> saying the thesis behind is relatively the same <laughs> it's been 18 months since you you got the guts to get back I on did there stack it pretty bad Still got like it a scar. Bad, yes, you still got a scar from that yeah, one. Stuck, yeah, did you? It's like a bit faded now, but it's fine. Interesting. I actually shared, shared that interest, interesting Instagram account with you. So I've been fa- following Ryan Holiday for a while. We've talked about him a bunch, and he actually has the daily stoic, um, I guess, mega brand that's on every platform, but he also has Daily Dad. Yeah. Which is, there's actually a book coming out in May about, I guess, like stoic lessons for parents. Uh, just to teach their kids how to like cope with life a bit easier and stuff. And they always share interesting accounts and reels on Instagram. And there's that one account, or there's one account in particular, I can't remember what it's called, uh, which is not helpful. Maybe we can share it in the show notes um, of just parents that show their kids how to like get up when they fall down and stuff. There's a guy that teaches his little daughter how to hit the skate ramp up, the half pipe, and they go snowboarding and stuff all the time. And every time she falls down, it's like a life lesson about, getting on with it, persevering despite getting hurt previously and just, I guess, picking yourself up, dusting yourself off and getting after it. So if a four-year-old can do it. I can do it too. you can do it. Yeah, that that video was very lovely. I was just like, oh my gosh, he is so cute because they mic her up as well. So you can see he, her, like talking while she's going down like the ski um, ramps and all that kind of stuff. Like it's very adorable. And she's like, ooh. ooh." (laughs) How'd you do it? Ooh. It's very, yeah. very cute. Super cute. Um, but if you got if you got kids, maybe that be might be a good book to get yeah. into. A kid is definitely more brave than I am. For now, yeah. Maybe your parents just didn't push you enough into that sort of stuff. I know mine didn't push me into like anything um, risky like that or anything that's that was gonna like build up your confidence. Because I used to skateboard and stuff a lot, but I was mm-hmm. terrified of going to the skate park because you know you hurt yourself once. If you don't have anyone around you that's like showing that supportive side, then. You just, you know, you never really get the courage to do it again because you've only got your internal dialogue going on. There's no one to, like, push you through those pain points, especially your friends are probably mocking you as well. You don't really want to give it a try again, at least in the in the, in the the dude world. Yeah, but if you think about it, right, so, like, when you're a kid, you don't have that fear aspect, right? So, like, there's this whole thing of, like, when a kid falls over, they look to their parents and it's usually the parents' reaction and whether they cry or don't cry yep. and whether they hurt themselves or not. So, like, my younger brother, for example, used to climb the tallest trees, all that kind of stuff, and just not be scared whatsoever. And, like, I would just look at it and be like, no, no, I'm all right, thank you, I don't want to do that. And he was only, like, two years younger than me. So, there was, like, at some point got to that where I was just like, I am too scared to you know, climb that tree or do that thing. So, like, at what age do you learn, like, fear that sort of stops you from, I guess, climbing a tree yeah. or going down, like, a ski ramp? Or A lot of it, like, I've been reading a lot lately about a lot of the things that or the innate behaviours and, uh, I guess, fears and stuff that we get. Like, if it feels like everything's learnt because, obviously, your parents and school and stuff, everything that you know and the way you act in the world is learnt behaviours. But a lot of the stuff is... You're just born with it. Like you hear about people that have um, twins, for example, or like identical twins, but their personalities are so different. It's like they come out of the womb with like a behavior and a personality to begin with. Like you can't, it's not like you can shape someone to be the perfect child or anything. They sort of come out a certain way to begin with and you can like craft it to a degree. But like some kids are just naturally come out introverted. Obviously there's like trauma or like life circumstances growing up that like, help refine or like mold you in certain ways but a lot of the stuff is just you're just born with it genetically yeah which is like i guess like there's more people that have more of a, a fear tolerance but the people that are doing like crazy cliff dives and stuff with like a wingsuit on like the adrenaline like junkies you either I, I don't know if you can like build yourself up to that 
You probably could because like it's that old that age old question of like nature versus nurture, right? Like what are you learn what have you learned and what do- what just comes naturally? I think there's a lot of stuff that, yeah, you'd have, I guess, some characteristics that you're born with that's like deep ingrained into your DNA, passed down from like your past generations or whatever. But there's also a lot, I think a lot of it is learned like Mm. through, because like kids are sponges, like crazy, crazy sponges. They're just going to continually absorb the environment around them. So you could have, you know, that no fear aspect that you're born with a bit, something happens or your parents are just like super cautious or like helicopter parents. So then you become cautious and that fear sort of like, just like dies away but then you have like a whole bunch of these people now that are doing you know just rewriting your brain and mm. you know relearning how to do something and overcome that fear aspect and then you know you've got crazy things like hypnotism that can just completely override all that, sort that of stuff. yeah that stuff can be a bit interesting but with the sponge though mm. there's always like some degree of moisture in the sponge like it's not ever a zero percent and no. then a hundred percent taking in. So I feel like it's a horrible analogy, but like <laughs> there's always like 10% moisture in the sponge, for example. So I feel like there is a certain percentage that just can't be changed mm-hmm. that sort of um, leads into uh, ways of behaving and stuff as you grow up. But I guess we're not parents, so we don't really have that much to say. I'm just um, repeating what I've heard. So Well, we can only really go off like ourselves and our siblings and our friends and stuff, right? Because yeah. like it's depending on like your group of friends, like you, ha- I had like a group of, like I had friends that had siblings and friends without siblings and just like totally different because you're going to absorb some of the behavioral traits from your siblings and stuff as well, just depending on who's in your circle. And then if you're, you know, if you're an only child, then you're just going to be, we yeah, a little bit different. So I think, yeah, it's probably a bit of both. Like you're born with some sort of characteristics that will push you through life. And then those can either, either be like overridden or like enhanced through your learned experiences. Yeah. I guess it's how many people you have around in your life. If you're only a child, you've, you've, you don't have other siblings to – like when you have siblings, you kind of have to fill in the gaps in a sense because one might be like super dominant in the, in the household or someone one might be super quiet. So it's kind of like you have to be like a yin and a yang to the family situation. So if that makes sense, like you, having two super introverted kids is like I don't, haven't really seen that too often. It's usually some degree of a yin and yang element in terms of – different um ends of the spectrum i guess you would say in terms of the family dynamic like not everyone in the family has the same sort of mentality so it's like how many people you can pick up from in your family unit mm-hmm. where if it's like your parents are just like one-on-one where if it's like four or five because you've got two or three siblings it's like you have to like trying to figure out how to fit within that so you're not like doubling up on the personality, if that makes sense. Yeah, or like it also gives you a chance to just like- turning into psychologists here. Yeah, I know, we're, we're super smart. Like, so just, it would just be like, yeah, from the people around you as well, you sort of learn quicker what you like and what you don't like. So I guess maybe you become more of an individual a lot quicker or like, it's the thing, like if you have siblings around you, you're going to learn or pick up things a lot quicker than someone who's a solo child. Same as like pets, for example. Like if you have like two dogs, you have an older dog, teaches like the younger dog. Like it's just one of those sort big of natural- dog. Big we dog. Call them big dogs. Big dogs. Big dogs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just one of those natural things because they're just you. You're going to observe, right? Like they're going to observe what's going on around them, and they're just going to pick things up quicker. So yeah, yeah. So in terms of the fear and stuff, mm. when do we pick up the skateboard again? We actually talked about this. What was it yesterday? Yeah, yeah I was just- <laughs> I'm sick of seeing it in the cupboard. To be honest, I'm no, going to start ripping true. some kick flips on it. If you don't start, yeah, because like a skateboard is designed to be like scratched up. If it's not on the wall as like an art piece, mm-hmm. you got to scratch that bad boy up. Yeah, um, you know what? I really should. You know what? Next week. Next week. Next week. Can we I'll lock get in a day, in a day and a time so I can rip, whip the camera out? Yeah, well, let's go for because what do I have next Sunday. Next Sunday. <laughs> next Sunday we're going yeah, skateboarding. Yeah, next Sunday early morning ride again. <laughs> See right. how I go. Put on the put on the uh, the shoulder pads and the wrist pads and the knee pads and shoulder pads. Did I say shoulder pads? I mean wrist pads, <laughs> elbow <laughs> pads. Don't have shoulder pads. I'm not in the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to do like a an NFL tackle while you're on it. Yeah, but that kind of like. I know we're going to probably maybe talk about it a little bit later in the pod, but like just the whole resistance thing, right? Like I've yeah. been reading a lot about it at the moment. Um, you've recently read The Art of War, War of Art. War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Yeah, and I've been listening to heaps of his podcasts lately. Um, I'm a big fan of Ryan Holiday and he's been on there. They're both big inspos and stuff. And it's just like this very unassuming old dude but he has like a lot of wisdom um and just the whole resistance aspect is like you just face it every single day the sooner the moment you wake up and like try to roll out of bed that's like resistance and then me not riding the skateboard is just like resistance i'm just letting the fear like override that aspect of just being like just do it yeah yeah it's a good book really good book and it's easy to read i encourage everyone to read it it's it's been out i think like 
since, since 2002, I think, War of Art, Stephen Pressfield. Uh, I'll pull it up on the image here just for you guys to look at. Um, there's a few follow-ups and things um, like sequels to the book if you want to dive in further. But the book um, premise is about resistance and how everything we do in life that can help get us to a higher version of ourselves, whether it's um, – it's like uh, in terms of starting a business, for example, you want to improve a business, improve relationships. You want to be, cre- it's more about the uh, creative element and being an mm-hmm. artist, whatever that means, a painter, writer, musician, um, about the internal resistance that we all deal with and something that we don't think about a lot. But he sort of personifies resistance as this entity that gets in our way. And I guess if you can think about it in terms of an external factor as an in- as opposed to an internal factor, it's easier to sort of visualize. Um, so, yeah, resistant. You can just imagine it as like a creepy monster, basically, like mm-hmm. stopping you from doing anything that's going to help you progress in terms of your business or your life. Anything that's going to get you to an improved state compared to where you are now is usually met with resistance. And the book is about identifying what resistance is, why it exists, how we can find tools to overcome it, um, and just ways of navigating life to essentially combat resistance so the book is titled the war of art it's kind of about how to have like a warrior mindset to your artistry and then in terms of being a warrior and like fighting resistance in terms of produ- to produce your art essentially yeah no I really, it's a really good book i really like the concept because even though it does say it's for creatives it's just really like that ethos of just like showing up every day doing the work and putting in those reps and putting in those habits like his big thing is like you don't necessarily need to have talent. You just need to pop, pop. You just need to put in the reps for it. So for him, it was just writing every single day, just yep. getting in that momentum. It doesn't matter if it's bad or good. It's just about doing the work. Doing the work. And it's just you hear about it from so many writers. Um, that I mean, there's a bunch of quotes I could rattle off, but I just can't pinpoint them to the actual person that came up with the quote. But a lot of it is um, just showing up, I think – um, one of them is just show up and write three shitty pages a day. Um, I think there might be a quote from someone, I'm just going to say Shakespeare just for the sake of it, or not Shakespeare, but like <laughs> someone, probably Hemingway or someone that's like um, someone asked them what your, how do you um, overcome your, like your resistance or whatever to write every day. And it's about, basically the answer is just like showing up the same time every day and just having a, a system essentially of doing the same amount of words every day, whether it's just having a target to work to, even if you know the outcome's going to be shit, eventually the, the shitty writing and the shitty work is going to um, be overcome or overridden by better work. It's a, a very simple way of putting it, but it's about showing up, mm-hmm. knowing that bad work will come out and then having faith in your abilities over time that something good will come out of it. Um, but it's an interesting, interesting, interesting book. Um, there's a bunch of podcasts you can listen to with him on there explaining it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've actually bought you a version. You have, yeah. Because yeah, I highlighted you, the hell out of mine. You did, as I always do. It's one of those ones because it's like it's not a long read either. It's like a short book. I'm like, I really want my own version to like, yeah, just to highlight and find my own points and everything. Because like I said, I've just been listening to him on different podcasts for ages, like Ryan Holiday, Rich Roll. Like, there's just so many to rattle off that he's been on, and he has like a, just a good, consistent, clean message. And I'm just like, I could definitely do this because I have. I struggle to get out of bed most days, but I have a lot of resistance, whether it is writing or creating a video or just like getting up and doing the work, like whether it's big on like procrastination, all that kind of stuff. So I feel like something simple as just like overriding that little nagging voice that says, just do it tomorrow. We've talked about Ryan Holiday's Discipline is Destiny book Mm. uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there's a, a common theme that is starting to emerge as all these pieces come together. And they all tie in together. It's like the main 10 to 20 books about um, self-help and performance and just getting on with life. Like they all have a common theme, but they all have different elements that will help create the like the ideal life. And not the ideal life in terms of, um, you know, picket fences or anything, but in terms of the ideal life of just getting through life without being miserable and doing things that you want to do for the sake of doing them because you think they're going to make a better world or a better version of yourself. So like the resistance getting out of bed can be, there's a few ways to overcome it. And one of them is just having discipline. Mm -hmm. Another way of like, for example, in this book, 
um, about writing every day, like it is resistance you have to overcome, but you have to have the discipline to show up every day to then beat. So it's like you need discipline to beat the resistance. Yes. So it's sort of they like tie in together really nicely. Um, the back half of the book is sort of examples of how to turn from an amateur mindset into a pro mindset, which I found quite interesting. So essentially with an amateur mindset, you just, you're just doing things – to compete with others if that makes sense you're trying to improve your standings in a hierarchy so it breaks it down like the way we like look at things and do things can either be hierarchy hierarchy i can always hard, hard to say this name hierarchical like in a hierarchy basically where you're yeah. trying to like improve your standings in, in some sort of group capacity or it can be territorial mm -hmm. so if you're trying to like improve your standings in a hierarchy you're basically in that competition mindset you're trying to compete with others. You're trying to improve your grades against the rest of the class. You're trying to um, improve your sales against the rest of the sales team. You're trying to improve your standings within a hierarchy. There's someone at the top. That's the big dog, as we mentioned. Yeah. Um, and they, they, they run the hierarchy, basically, and there's someone at the lower end, and you want to fit somewhere in the middle, and you don't want to lose your spot and go lower down the totem pole. You want to keep improving. And that's sort of the amateur mindset because you're always competing. You're always looking to validate and impress other people and prove yourself why you deserve a spot. Whereas like the pro mindset of turning pro is about being territorial and claiming your territory and not really worrying about other people are doing and just showing up, being disciplined, doing the work and just claiming your spot. Like imagine like an alligator, like is he worried about what the other, guy, other alligators are doing? No, he's like, this swamp is mine. I don't care what's going on around me. Like we're not trying to compete for like, I mean, they do have a hierarchy, I guess, in mm. terms of size, but, but it's kind yeah. of more just like territorial, like what kind of space do I occupy and dominate? Like, for example, like this podcast room mm -hmm. there, we're not competing with anyone. No. It's, this is our territory. It's ours to mold and form how we want. And it actually what we feed this territory feeds us back in terms of creativity and relaxation and what, like what you put into it is what you get out of it. But if we're worried about where are we in, in the podcast rankings all the time, then that's like an amateur mindset instead of, instead of like focusing on your territory and just trying to get better within that territory compared to yourself, basically. That, I found that really interesting, just turning from an amateur to a pro mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be applied to everything, right? Yeah, it's almost like what fuels you, right? So if you did have that amateur mindset, you're fueled by all the wrong reasons, then it's just going to be short-lived and you're going to burn yourself out in the long run. Because there's like so many people that say, yeah, you want to you want to be able to give back, not take. And if you have that, if you're constantly competing, you're com like taking away, just trying to like get leg up one after the other. And there's just, there's no value in that really because you're doing it for yourself in the long run. Like you're just trying to do it for show, just to try to be that number one spot. Whereas- if you stake your claim and be like, this is me, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm showing up for, take it or leave it. It's totally up to you. I'm still going to do it regardless. I feel like that's the better reasons and better for longevity as well because it just shows you that you're not there for, you know, the number one position. You're there just to be who you are. Yeah. And the, the it's not to be confused with like your abilities either. It's the mindset. Like you can be an amateur, like we're amateur podcasts, mm -hmm. but it's about if you have a pro mindset, then you're not getting caught in amateur games. But you can be a professional podcaster and be competing day in, day out for number one ranking or mm -hmm. anyone else in your industry. But you're you're a professional at what you do, but you're still still in an amateur mindset. It's like ego versus hum humility, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, like do you have that ego and that's all you care about is being top dog or are you like humble and just like just want to bring value? Yeah, mm. it, it's a really good book. It touches on ego. Ema Emo, and we're in, e we're in emo shirts. So I want to say yeah. emo. Um, it touches on ego and stuff in there as mm -hmm. well. But it's just a lot of a lot of these. Like I love learning about this and love hearing about different leaders in their fields um, who have been around for ages that are doing things, but they don't never really have like that competitive mindset. I guess they are competitive, but it's not what drives them. They just by nature competitive because they have to get better at what they do, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, you have like, you, you see it a lot with like, uh, 
was about to say sportsman, but like sportsmanship and all that kind of stuff. Because you have to be competitive because you need to have that competitive mindset to like win, right? Because like that's, there is like literally a gold medal at the end of the race. Like if you do win that kind of thing or a trophy, whereas like someone like, someone like Stephen Pressfield, he's very much always like trying to raise those people around him. So he's always being like, oh, this is a really good person. You should listen to them. Or I really like what you're doing. Or if like, oh, if you have an idea, go with it kind of thing. He's never much talking about himself he's always like trying to raise those around him yeah it's and i've also heard a lot recently about following your passion Mm. we talk about this quite a bit about you hear a lot of people online that are like follow your passion do what you're passionate about try and turn your passion into your business or your profit or if you can you know um Make a make some sort of make some sort of employment or something out of your passion, then that's like the golden ticket through life. But like, there's more and more contradictory evidence that I start to see about like that's not the best way to approach things because the more you focus on doing your passion, the more it becomes a, a job and a chore, and mm-hmm. it takes away from the the joy that initially sparked your interest in that passion. So, for example, like. What I've heard a lot of people say recently is m- perhaps make a list of your passions and then go all in on your second or third passion so your first one doesn't get compromised and you actually lose it as your main passion. Mm-hmm. So, for example, like what are you most passionate about? Fire, right, put me on the spot. I should know this. Like I'm most passionate about like I want like reading, writing, um, it's, 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 yeah. sorry, it's a, I just threw you on the spot. It's a hard question because there's like this, for me, I can't even answer that. So I shouldn't really throw it out there because I have so many mid-range passions, but there's not one that stands out dramatically above mm-hmm. all else. Like let's say you just love basketball above all else. Yeah. Like you, you listen to podcasts all day about it. You bet about it every game. You watch every game that comes on. You're on blogs and forums, but you actually love running a, a, a business making hats as mm-hmm. well and you just love fashion in particular hats if you spend all your time making content and talking like trying to turn your passion into a business then eventually you're going to like start to resent the actual passion because you're spending too much time on it so it's almost better to um if you want to like work for yourself and like live on a passion and turn passion into profit doing a passion that second or third tier down so you're not uh, encroaching on like your main thing for the rest of your life. Otherwise it's going to, um, like you said, become a chore and take the joy out of it. Yeah. So well, that's a really important thing that we're kind of focusing on, but it's hard for me because I can't pinpoint one thing that I just have 10 moderate passionate things I'm interested about. Like, yeah, but like with anything, as soon as you add like a monetary value to it, there's that level of pressure to perform yes. and that level of pressure to succeed. So just say, and that yeah. puts you in an amateur mindset of competing as opposed to, the territorial exactly just you know putting the state like this is what i want to do this is who i am um yeah super super interesting but it's just one of those things of just being very wary about how you approach things and just constantly reflecting on it just so you know be like all right how am i approaching this what is my thoughts but yeah when you when you are passionate about so many things or just mildly passionate about so many things and it's not easier because it can be a little bit harder to pick one thing, but at least you know you're not going to burn out because you're probably just going to be passionate about something a year later, something else. And if you think about the people that are successful, like anyone that's mega successful and it's a household name, right, they're the outliers. It's hard to get real-world data from the people that are at the pinnacle at the very, very top. Michael Jordan, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, mm-hmm. like – is Elon Musk passionate about electronic cars? I, you know what? I Probably not. Cool, right? Yeah. Like he started at PayPal. He did five other things afterwards. He just mm-hmm. was passionate enough about it and then went all in. Uh, I think last week we mentioned the lady that founded the femtech industry more or less. Yeah. She did four or five things and then did femtech. Do you think she was the most passionate about femtech or was the second or third thing that she was most passionate about? She was interested, mm-hmm. but she wasn't like, overly consumed by it 24 7 and just had to make it work otherwise you wouldn't enjoy it as much michael jordan probably a different example he's pretty passionate well, that's about why I say sports is sort of like sort of their own sort of aspect to that because like with sports you, you definitely have need, to be it's obsessed. a particular mindset yeah you have to be obsessed about yeah. it and i think with yeah especially with sports and wanting that's to exceed yeah it's like it's a completely different mindset and it's like 
so, so interesting as well because as millennials, we're taught as young kids, follow your dreams, follow your passion. Like that's the path you should take. But really, like that's what we're finding out now is like that's not not necessarily the best thing to do. So maybe it more applies to business and artistry because like mm-hmm. sports is hard. Like we watched that golf um, documentary. Um, what was it called? Does it- I want to say strike something. Off the green. I can't remember yeah. what it was called. I watched it two <laughs> weeks ago on Netflix. Um, they, they're obsessed about it. They travel around the world in jets and going playing golf and stuff. But like the sporting people, they kind of all do their main passion. The, the Williams sisters, right? They mm-hmm. like they're, All they did was watch that movie with um, Will Smith, King Richard, I think it was called. Yeah, it was, yeah. And they're just obsessed about tennis. Yeah. So that's the interesting um, point you bring up. Maybe sports is the differentiator because it has to be all-consuming. Well, just but imagine, sorry to it, cut you off, like just imagine if you were wanting to do the Olympics, right? You have to be obsessed for like at least four years. 12 like, hours a day. Yeah, 100% and, and want to be like, because it's that mindset of wanting to literally be the best in the world, right? If you're in basketball, Michael Jordan being the best in the NBA, like having that needing to be the best mentality Again, yeah, like like you're saying, it's like a Do you think it's a a time constraint factor, knowing that they don't have until their 60s to make it work and they've only got at best into their 20s and 30s before they're considered too old to compete and therefore you have to go hard immediately, whereas business or art, you know, you hear all these stories about um, whoever it is, some big business owner or famous artist has been doing it for 30 years and then they get their their final break in their 60s or something Mm -hmm. maybe there's a more of a longevity play in arts and business compared to sports that is a very very interesting point because your body only lasts for so long and especially something so physical and something so draining like tiger woods for example there's only so long that you can swing like that and michael jordan is only so long you can jump like that like if you're you know in you know the world's best like soccer team or whatever it is like there's only so long that you can run like it's a very very interesting concept or like even like Muhammad Ali there's only so many times he can be punched in the head like it's must be it would have to be like a time restraint because you know that you only have a certain time frame so they get so obsessed because they're like I've got until I'm like 40 at the most interesting or they just haven't found a secondary thing to be obsessed about during those adolescent years when Mm -hmm. it's when you're really making your making your ways and really diving into it. Yeah. Well, there was the, I can't remember her name, but she was um, in America's like Olympian soccer team. Um, and she was on Ryan Holiday's recent like podcast episode. And she was talking about how she was like obsessed as a kid and just wanted to play soccer all the time. But she like got kicked out of like the under twenties. And then uh, she was thinking about giving up, but her parents knew that she loved it. They always invented, invested a lot of time and spent a lot of time in getting that done. Um, that she, you know, ended up changing her habits and just running more and, you know, just making the effort to like be better and then got into the next team. And then all those people that were in those under twenties ended up not going to college to play, not playing professionally, ended up just giving up or just not doing it anymore and she was like what was the reason that was different like why did I succeed even though I wasn't as good as them like they were better than me but they decided to all drop off and it comes back to being yeah obsessed how much of this is pro mindset yeah. it's crazy mm-hmm. it's, re- it's really interesting to break it down like that because when you think of artists a lot of the artists you like you don't really hear of like world phenom 20 year old artists they're no. all like in their 50s and 60s they've been around for decades grinding it out going through different iterations of artistic styles um fashion trends that sort of thing mm-hmm. so it's and like especially the artists that you know do you, do you would you like uh, i don't know andy warhol or basquiat um all these famous artists or even musician artists like bruce springsteen for example any of these people do you think they have a, an amateur mindset at all do you think they're even remotely comparing themselves to other artists or they're just in the studio doing their work, getting shit done, claiming their territory. Territory, Like that's yeah. literally the difference. Very, very interesting. Super interesting. But yeah, those- Business, that- I think, is a bit more competitive though. Business can be, but I think that's where it sort of like draws the lines. Like you can be competitive, but you can't let that competition rule your life or else you're just going to make mistakes and you're doing it all for the wrong reasons where yeah. you need to have that pro aspect to it as well. Like it's the, what's the Gary Vee quote always get wrong? Micro patience, macro time? No. <laughs> Macro patience, micro speed. Yes. So long, like long term in the long game, mm-hmm. sustainability, 20, 30, 40 years, be mm-hmm. patient, mm-hmm. 
being patient, knowing that you're going to fail multiple times, you've got multiple shots. But in the micro, like right now, speed, like today's speed matters. Get it done. Beat resistance today. Be disciplined today. Get the speed done. Doesn't have to be perfect. Knock it out of the park today. Knock it out tomorrow, knowing that next week you might fail. Next month you might fail. So micro speed, macro patience. Micro speed. And it's, it's a very um, truncated or simplified approach, but it makes sense. It's a simple way of conveying that stuff today matters to get it done. You can't like delay or put things off or be indecisive about things. But long term, you've got to be prepared um, for the long tail, for the long game, for mm-hmm. uh, decades of um, a roller coaster ride of you know ups and downs. Yeah, yeah, far out. Like that's yeah, that resistance is like very huge. But yeah, the art of you might not have to read, might not have to read it now. I've just broken it we've down. We've had a good concept. No, I still I want to have my own highlights and everything. Well, there's that. The second book is called Turning Pro, and I've ordered that. Oh, cool. Um, the second part of this book is about amateur versus pro mindset. So I'm not sure how much further it goes into that pro pro stuff. Um, but I was, was watching an interview about a month ago with um chris williamson that does modern wisdom podcast Mm -hmm. and he said he was like doing his podcast for a year or two um and sort of just like skating on the surface doing like not the bare minimum but like doing enough to like get it going at like a low level kind of like what we're doing now just week to week just punching the clock and just getting it done right and then he read War of Art and then read Turning Pro mm-hmm. and it just shifted his mindset completely. He started going to two or three episodes a week, going after crazy, crazy guests, just trying to, I guess, stake his claim. Like you said, put your flag in the ground saying, this is my zone. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to compete with anyone. And then like that sort of after that mentality and after like grinding that with discipline for a couple of years, um, he sort of exploded as one of the like probably a top fifty podcasts in the world right now. Yeah, he's really shutting up like this whole year. Like it's just been. So, yeah, the last two years or so. Mm. Yep, he's been pr- pretty br- pretty massive. He does put in a lot of work, a lot of production quality. He does mm-hmm. a lot of research on guests. Gets high quality guests. Gets multiple guests per week. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just literally turned it into he like a pro mindset. Yeah. Um, so it can be done, but again, it's speed today, patience long term. Mm-hmm. Because so, like you said, we was doing it for like, what, a good three years? Yeah. There's, there's a graph he did recently on Twitter showing um, his podcast downloads. Like the first two years, it's just like 50 downloads, 100 downloads. And then all of a sudden, it's just a, a huge uh, exponential growth mm-hmm. just simply from the, the work that goes into it, right? Yeah. Like it's the same as writing every day. You're going to write, put out 50 shitty words a day or 500 shitty words a day, for example, you're going to put out 200 crappy episodes and then it's going to start snowballing. Mm-hmm. The skills are going to develop. It's just not getting caught with amateur mindset. No, you just speed. got to put in the reps and show up every day. So talking about speed, um, we'll speed out of this episode right now, <laughs> but be patient for the later episode this week coming on Friday. Um, we'll share what's going on in the news world with the tech and business and perhaps the banking crisis. And yeah. we'll give our playlist recommendation for Mm -hmm. your weekend so stick around we'll see you guys later in the week thanks bye